Hello， 又嚟到 Maria 英文讀書會。上次講 J.K. Rowling 喺出 Harry Potter 嘅時候咧，就俾二十幾間出版社拒絕咗。之後我就睇翻好多資料啦，就見到 J.K. Rowling 本人佢自己話係其實幾間唔係廿幾間出版社拒絕。所以當我哋睇資料嘅時候咧，就最好揾翻本人親自講嘅説話，因為就算知名媒體嘅資訊都有機會會出錯嘅。今日我會到 Harry Potter 之餘咧，亦都準備咗賣 Jungle Pop Up Book Illustrated by Gil Gyle 同埋 Text by Gil Davis。It's a very colorful book. Hope you like it. His, his, Mr. Sneak, slippy, slither, sliding, sneaking through the grasses, zigzagging into hiding. So if you see this very colorful sneak, it is yellow with bright orange spots. So are you afraid of snakes? I personally am okay. I'm not too afraid of snakes, but I'm actually quite afraid of cockroaches. So you can see this colorful snake slithering and sliding through the colorful grasses. Let's see. We have this very cute green turtle. Mother turtle on the shore lays a hundred eggs or more. Then she swims away and titters. I'll soon need a hundred babysitters. So this mother turtle just gave birth to a hundred baby turtles. So we be expecting very cute baby turtles coming out, and we also see a lot of fishes. And actually, a crab here reading a fish magazine. And a frog here, some bugs here. They're wearing scuba diving gear. They're all here to witness Mother Turtle giving birth to a hundred baby turtles. What an amazing scene! Let's see what we've got next. I love to hang upside down, says Bat, especially when eating a plum. Then all the juice drips straight below, instead of on my tum. So I guess it is a smart move. The bat is upside down while drinking the juice of the plum, so the juice doesn't fall all over his tummy, his body. And、um, bats actually love eating fruits. We've got a lot of fruits here today. We've got plums. We've got bananas. We've got oranges. So bats, they also like to eat pollen, nectar, as well as insects. So maybe this little one should be more careful and stay away from the bats. Wow, what a handsome gorilla! The big and hairy gorilla. Makes a nest inside a tree, then he roars and beats his chest, shouting, "Come and look at me!" So this gorilla definitely thinks that he's very handsome, because he's telling everyone, "Come and look at me!" Well, he certainly has a lot of audience. We've got some birds here. We have a butterfly. We have some bugs on the other side. Actually, this bird is eating one of his bananas. I don't know if he's his real audience, but you can definitely see this gorilla is very strong and muscular. Actually, gorillas are very similar to humans. About 95 to 99 percent of their DNA is the same as us, so we're only one percent away from a gorilla. Come and play," says Crocodile, with such an open, beaming smile. Okay, the fish say, then pause, but only if you close your jaws. Well, I think these fishes are quite smart. 
because if you want to play first, you have to close your jaw because as you can see, the crocodile has very, very sharp teeth. You definitely don't want to put your finger here. You don't want to be bitten by a crocodile. The cuddly giant panda gently rocks her baby. Can she reach a bamboo shoot? I think she can, maybe. So as you can see, this panda is hiding from us. But um, I actually love panda because they're really, really cuddly and soft. They have an adorable personality. They're very playful. They like to climb around and they like to eat bamboo shoots. Wow, very colorful chameleon. A green chameleon turns blue to match the summer sky. Then he flicks out his sticky tongue and gobbles up a fly. Chameleons are very interesting lizards because they actually change color. This one is changing from green to blue. That's why they're called chameleons, ever-changing. It's actually very smart because if they see an enemy approaching them, they can actually change the color of their skin to match the background so that it becomes a camouflage. So the en enemies won't be able to see them as well. They can also change their skin color according to temperatures. If they are cold, they can actually change into a darker shade to absorb heat. And if they're hot, they can change it to a lighter shade to be cooler. So chameleons are very, very smart. <clears throat> okay, we have two colorful parrots. A pair of parrots, busy talking, fill the jungle with their squawking. From tree to tree, they fly and twitter, followed by noisy chitter chatter. So these two parrots seem to be talking and having a great time. Actually, parrots are very smart. They can imitate human speech. I've heard parrots speak perfect English. Have you heard parrots speak any other language? Let us know. Wow, check out this very colorful butterfly. Butterfly flutters and flies above all the jungle trees, making giraffes stop and stare as she dances on the breeze. So this giraffe is looking at this beautiful butterfly. I love butterflies because they're so colorful and I get surprised all the time because they all have different patterns, different color combinations. It's like looking at a kaleidoscope. It's a surprise every time. Check out this tiger. Tiger glides through the grass with silence and with grace. He looks at all the antelope and wonders which one to chase. So we've got this tiger with striped fur, black and golden, tawny, and um, he's chasing all the antelope. Antelopes. Antelopes are distinguished by their horns. So they look like they're having fun being chased and chasing. So of all the animals that you've seen today, which one is your favorite? Well, for me, definitely pandas because they're really cuddly. So let me know which is your favorite animals. Okay. So let's continue with Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Today we are going to start on chapter 8, the end of chapter 8, and we're also going to read chapter 9. Harry thought that none of the lessons he'd had so far had given him as much to think about as tea with Hagrid. Had Hagrid collected that package just in time? Where was it now? 
And did Hagrid know something about Snape that he didn't want to tell Harry? End of chapter eight. Chapter nine, the midnight duel. Harry had never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley. But that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first year Gryffindors only had potions with the Slytherins. So they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much, or at least they didn't until they spotted a notice pinned up in the Gryffindor common room, which made them all groan. Flying lessons would be starting on Thursday, and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typical, said Harry darkly. Just what I always wanted, to make a fool of myself on a broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than anything else. You don't know you'll make a fool of yourself, said Ron reasonably. Anyway, I know Malfoy's always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk. Malfoy certainly didn't talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting in the house Quidditch teams and told long boastful stories which always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles in helicopters. He wasn't the only one though. The way Seamus Finnegan told it, He'd spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone who'd listen about the time he'd almost hit a hand glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory, about football. Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game with only one ball where no one was allowed to fly. Harry had caught Ron prodding Dean's poster of West Ham football team, trying to make the players move. Neville had never been on a broomstick in his life because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she'd had good reason because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents, even with both feet on the ground. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something you couldn't learn by heart out of a book, not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday, she bored them all with stupid, flying tips she'd got out of a library book called Quidditch Through the Ages. Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later. But everybody else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of the post. Harry hadn't had a single letter since Hagrid's note something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he opened gloatingly at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. It's a rememberall, he explained. Grand knows I forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look, you hold it tight like this, and if it turns red, oh. His face fell because the rememberall had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor table, snatched the rememberall out of his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. 
They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy. But Professor McGonagall, who could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my remember-all, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the remember-all back on the table. Just looking, he said, and he sloped away with Crab and Goyle behind him. At 3.30 that afternoon, Harry, Ron, and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps into the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day, and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawns towards a smooth lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the Forbidden Forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Slytherins were already there, and so were twenty broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the school brooms, saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high, or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived. She had short gray hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are you all waiting for? She barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old and some of the twigs stuck out at odd angles. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madame Hooch at the front, and say, up. Up, everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few that did. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over on the ground and Neville's hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell when you were afraid, thought Harry. There was a Quaker in Neville's voice that said only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end, and walked up and down the rows, correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy he'd been doing it wrong for years. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off from the ground hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your brooms steady. Rise a few feet and then come back straight back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle, two, one. But Neville, nervous and jumpy and frightened of being left on the ground, pushed off hard before the whistle had touched Madame Hooch's lips. Come back, boy, she shouted. But Neville was rising straight up like a cork shot out of a bottle. Twelve feet, twenty feet. Harry saw his scared white face look down at the ground falling away, saw him gasp, slip sideways off the broom, and wham! A thud and a nasty crack, and Neville lay face down on the grass in a heap. His broomstick was still rising higher and higher and started to drift lazily towards the forbidden forest and out of sight. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville, her face as white as his. Broken wrist. Harry heard her mutter. Come on, boy. It's all right. Up you get. She turned to the rest of the class. None of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave these brooms where they are or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say Quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville. His face tear-streaked, clutching his wrist, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. No sooner were they out of earshot than Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face, the great lump? The other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy snapped Parvati Patil. 
O sticking up for long bottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a hard-faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you'd like fat little crybabies, Pervardy. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. The rememberall glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that here, Malfoy, said Harry quietly. Everyone stopped talking to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to collect. How about up a tree? Give it here, Harry yelled. But Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been lying. He could fly well, hovering level with the topmost branches of an oak, he called. Come and get it, Potter. He grabbed his broom. No, shouted Hermione Granger. Madam Hooch told us not to move. You get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground and up, up he soared. Air rushed through his hair and his ropes whipped out behind him. And in a rush of fierce joy, he realized he'd found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take it even higher and heard screams and gasps of girls back on the ground and an admiring whoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked stunned. Give it here, Harry called, or I'll knock you off that broom. Oh yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer, but looking worried. Harry knew somehow what to do. He leaned forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands, and he shot towards Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy only just got out of the way in time. Harry made a sharp about turn and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No crap and goil up here to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, then, he shouted. And he threw the glass ball high into the air and shrieked back towards the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leaned forward and pointed his broom handle down. Next second, he was gathering speed in a steep dive, racing the ball. Wind whistled in his ears, mingled with the screams of people watching. He stretched out his hand. A foot from the ground, he caught it just in time to pull his broom straight and he toppled gently onto the grass with a remember all clutched safely in his fist. Harry Potter! His heart sank faster than he just dived. Professor McGonagall was running towards them. He got to his feet, trembling. Never! In all my time at Hogwarts! Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with shock and her glasses flashed furiously. How dare you? Might have broken your neck. It wasn't his fault, Professor. Be quiet, Miss Patil. But Malfoy, that's enough. Mr. Weasley, Potter, follow me now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle's triumphant faces as he left walking numbly in Professor McGonagall's wake as she strode towards the castle. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong with his voice. Professor McGonagall was sweeping along without even looking at him. He had to jog to keep up. Now he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'd be packing his bags in ten minutes. What would the Dursley say when he turned up on the doorstep? 
up the front steps, up the marble staircase inside, and still Professor McGonagall didn't say a word to him. She wrenched open doors and marched along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. Maybe she was taking him to Dumbledore, he thought of Hagrid, expelled but allowed to stay on as gamekeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined it, watching Ron and the others becoming wizards while he stumped around the ground, carrying Hagrid's back. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Flitwick, could I borrow wood for a moment? What? thought Harry bewildered. Was wood a cane? she was going to use on him, but Wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy who came out of Flitwick's class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said Professor McGonagall, and they marched on up the corridor, Wood looking curiously at Harry. In here, Professor McGonagall pointed them into a classroom which was empty except for Peeves who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves, she barked. Peeves threw the chalk into a bin, which clanged loudly, and he swooped out cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Pacha, this is Oliver Wood. Wood, I found you a seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said Professor McGonagall crisply. The boy's a natural. I've never seen anything like it. Was that your first time on a broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently. He didn't have a clue what was going on, but he didn't seem to be being expelled and some of the feelings started coming back to his legs. He caught that thing in his hand after a 50-foot dive. Professor McGonagall told Wood, didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all of his dreams had come true at once. Ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter? He asked excitedly. Woods, captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGonagall explained. He's just the build for a seeker too, said Wood, now walking around Harry and staring at him. Light, speedy, we'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor, a Nimbus 2000 or a clean sweep 7, I'd say. I shall speak to Professor Dumbledore and see if we can't bend the first year rule. Heaven knows, we need a better team than last year. Flattened on that last match by Slytherin, I couldn't look Severus Snape in the face for weeks. Professor McGonagall peered sternly over her glasses at Harry. I want to hear your training hard, Pacha, or I may change my mind about punishing you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. You're joking. It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened when he'd left the grounds with Professor McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and kidney pie halfway to his mouth, but he'd forgotten all about it. Seeker, he said. But first years never. You must be the youngest house player in about a century said Harry, shuffling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Ron was so amazed, so impressed. He just sat and gaped at Harry. I start training next week, said Harry. Only don't tell anyone. Wood wants to keep it a secret. Fred and George Weasley now came into the hall spotted Harry and hurried over. Well done, said George in a low voice. Wood told us, we're on the team too, beaters. 
I tell you, we are going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left, but this, this year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood was almost skipping when he told us. Anyway, we've got to go. Lee Jordan reckons he's found a new secret passageway out of the school. Bet it's that one behind the statue of Gregory the Smormy that we found in our first week. See ya! Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcome turned up. Malfoy, flanked by Crab and Goyle. Having a last meal, Potter? When are you getting the train back to the Muggles? You're a lot braver now you're back on the ground and you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was, of course, nothing at all little about Crab and Goyle. But as the high table was full of teachers, neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl. I take you on my own anytime, said Malfoy. Tonight, if you want, wizard stool. Wands only, no contact. What's the matter? Never heard of a wizard stool before, I suppose? Of course he has, said Ron, wheeling around. I'm his second, who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crap and Goyle, sizing them up. Crap, he said. Midnight, all right? We'll meet you in the trophy room. That's always unlocked. When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What is a wizard's duel? said Harry. And what do you mean you're my second? Well, a second's there to take over if you die, said Ron casually, getting started at last on his cold pie. Catching the look on Harry's face, he added quickly, but people only die in proper duels, you know, with real wizards. The most you and Malfoy will be able to do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you knows enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse anyway. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? Throw it away and punch him on the nose, Ron suggested. Excuse me, they both looked up. It was Hermione Granger. Can a person eat a piece in this place? said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhearing what you and Malfoy were saying. Bet you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering around the school at night. Think of all the points you'll lose Gryffindor if you're caught. You're bound to be. It's really very selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. All the same, it wasn't what you'd call the perfect end to the day, Harry thought, as he lay awake much later listening to Dean and Seamus falling asleep. Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all evening giving him advice such as, if he tries to curse you, you'd better dodge it because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance that they were going to get caught by Filch or Mr. Mrs. Norris, and Harry felt he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept looming up out of the darkness. This was his big chance to beat Malfoy face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past eleven, Ron muttered at last. We'd better go. They pulled on their dressing gowns, picked up their wands, and crept across the tower room, down the spiral staircase, and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning all the armchairs into hunched black shadows that almost reached the portrait hall when a voice spoke from the chair nearest to them. I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger, wearing a pink dressing gown and a frown. You, said Ron furiously, go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped. Percy, he's a prefect. 
he'd put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed open the portrait of the fat lady and climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron through the portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. Don't you care about Gryffindor? Do you only care about yourselves? I don't want Slytherin to win the House Cup and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. Go away. All right, but I warned you. You just remember what I said when you're on the train home tomorrow. You're so... But what they were, they didn't find out. Hermione had turned to the portrait of the fat lady to get back inside and found herself facing an empty painting. The fat lady had gone on a nighttime visit and Hermione was locked out of the Gryffindor Tower. Now what am I going to do? She asked frilly. That's your problem, said Ron. We've got to go. We're going to be late. They hadn't even reached the end of the corridor when Hermione caught up with them. I'm coming with you, she said. You're not. Do you think I'm going to stand out here and wait for Filch to catch me? If he finds all three of us, I'll tell him the truth, that I was trying to stop you and you can back me up. You've got some nerve, said Ron loudly. Shut up, both of you, said Harry sharply. I heard something. It was a sort of snuffling. Mrs. Norris? breathed Ron, squinting through the dark. It wasn't Mrs. Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor, fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept nearer. Thank goodness you found me. I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get into bed. Keep your voice down, Neville. The password's Takes snout, but it won't help you now. The fat lady's gone off somewhere. How's your arm? said Harry. Fine, said Neville, showing them. Madame Pomfrey mended it in about a minute. Good. Well, look, Neville, we've got to be somewhere. We'll see you later. Don't leave me, said Neville, scrambling to his feet. I don't want to stay here alone. The bloody baron's been passed twice already. Ron looked at his watch and then glared furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I've learned that curse of the bogeys Crow told us about and used it on you. Hermione opened her mouth, perhaps to tell Ron exactly how to use the curse of the bogeys. But Harry hissed at her to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. They flitted along corridors striped with bars of moonlight from the high windows. At every turn, Harry expected to run into Filch or Mrs. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up a staircase to the third floor and tiptoed towards the trophy room. Malfoy and Crabbe weren't there yet. The crystal trophy cases glimmered where the moonlight caught them. Cups, shields, plates, and statues winked silver and gold in the darkness. They etched along the walls, keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt in and started at once. The minutes crept by. He's late. Maybe he's chickened out. One whispered. Then a noise in the next room made them jump. Harry had only just raised his wand when they heard someone speak, and it wasn't Malfoy. Sniff around, my sweet. They might be lurking in a corner. It was Filch speaking to Mrs. Norris, horror-struck. Harry waved madly at the other three to follow him as quickly as possible. They scurried silently towards the door away from Filch's voice. Neville's ropes had barely whipped around the corner when they heard Filch enter the trophy room. They're in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. This way, Harry mouthed to the others and petrified. 
they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits of armor. They could hear Filch getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. He tripped, grabbed Ron around the waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clanging and crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run! Harry yelled, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery. Now looking back to see whether Filch was following, they swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corridor, then another. Harry in the lead without any idea where they were or where they were going. They ripped through a tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurtled along it and came out near their charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent double, wheezing and spluttering. I told you, Hermione gasped, clutching at the stitch in her chest. I told you. We've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron quickly as possible. Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Fuge knew someone was going to be here in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tipped him off. Harry thought she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more than a dozen paces where a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of a classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. Shut up, Peeves, please. You'll get us thrown out. Peeves cackled. Wandering around at midnight, a cold firsties. Ta ta ta, naughty naughty, you'll get caught, eh? Not if you don't give us away, Peeves, please. Shall tell Filch, Sh I should, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. This was a big mistake. Students out of bed, Peeves bellowed. Students out of bed down the charms corridor. Ducking under Peeves, they ran for their lives right to the end of the corridor where they slammed into a door and it was locked. This is it, Ron moaned as they pushed helplessly at the door. We're done for, this is the end. They could hear footsteps, Filch running as fast as he could towards Peeves' shout. Oh, move over, Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, Alohomora. The lock clicked, and the door swung open. They piled through it, shut it quickly, and pressed their ears against it, listening. Which way did they go, Peeves? Filch was saying, quick, tell me. Say please. Don't mess with me, Peeves. Now where do they go? Shan't say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying sing-song voice. All right, please. Nothing. Ha ha. Told you I wouldn't say nothing if you didn't say please. Ha ha ha. And they heard the sound of Peeves wishing away and Village cursing in rage. He thinks this door is locked. Harry whispered, I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville. For Neville had been tugging on the sleeve of Harry's dressing gown for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw quite clearly what. For a moment, he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare. This was too much, on top of everything that had happened so far. They weren't in a room, as he had supposed. They were in a corridor, the forbidden corridor on the third floor. 
and now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog, a dog which filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. It had three heads, three pairs of rolling mad eyes, three noses twitching and quivering in their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging in slippery ropes from yellowish fangs. It was standing quite still, all six eyes staring at them, and Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken it by surprise. But it was quickly getting over that. There was mo no mistaking what those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped for the doorknob. Between Filch and Seth, he'd take Filch. They fell backwards. Harry slammed the door shut, and they ran. They almost flew back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else because they didn't see him anymore, anywhere. But they hardly cared. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and that monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the seventh floor. Where on earth have you all been? She asked, looking at their dressing gowns hanging off their shoulders and their flushed, sweaty faces. Never mind that. Pig snout, pig snout, panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. They scrambled into the common room and collapsed trembling into armchairs. It was a while before any of them said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as if he'd never speak again. What do you think they're doing, keeping a thing like that locked up in a school? Said Ron finally. If any dog needs exercise, that one does. Hermione had got both her breath and her bad temper back again. You don't use your rise, any of you do she snapped. Didn't you see what it was standing on? The floor, Harry suggested. I wasn't looking at its feet. I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We could all have been killed or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind, he said. You think we dragged her along, wouldn't you? But Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed back to bed. The dog was guarding something. What had Hagrid said? Gringotts was the safest place in the world for something you wanted to hide except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found out where the grubby little package from Vault 713 was. End of chapter 9. 好了,今日的每日英文讀書會時間差不多了,我們下次再見。